Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Lord God, we submit ourselves to the authority of your holy word, asking that your spirit would open our eyes to see and our hearts to hear. Show us Jesus, teach us the gospel, make us your people for the sake of communicating the goodness and glory of your name, we pray, amen. So when I was at college at my sacred alma mater, Wheaton College, where our daughter Sophie now attends as a freshman, and which is where she now lives as of last week, apart from us, by herself, in a galaxy far, far away, sniff, sniff, still in recovery from that. Hi, kiddo. At Wheaton, there's this phrase that professors and administrators sometimes use that became formative for me and that I began hearing a lot as a freshman, and it's this. All truth is God's truth. I remember that when I first heard this, the implications hit me like a ton of bricks. All truth is God's truth truth. You see, as a kid who took ideas and words and the life of the mind seriously and who felt constantly intellectually threatened by the culture around me, I went into college with the purpose of becoming the world's smartest human in order to prove all the God-haters wrong. (laughs) That's clearly an, an ongoing project. So anyway, when I heard this phrase for the first time, it was, it was like a revelation for me. All truth is God's truth. As a freshman, it was like the world opened up to me in a way I hadn't seen. So you mean that if anything is true in any field or area of study or or even any area of life, even if I was unfamiliar with it or it seemed threatening to my faith or my understanding of the world, it was true because God made it true? It was so freeing. And even better at the time, I was beginning to understand in my Bible and theology classes that That things were not merely true because God said they were, as if he speaks sort of arbitrarily, and things are merely true because of the mechanism of him speaking, and there was no good reason for it. But things were true because of who God is. And when he speaks, what he says is true because he is true. Think about this. Things are true because God is in himself truth. So everything he says at bottom fundamentally is altogether true. He cannot speak lies. He never says anything false. The implication of his words are forever right as far as we could possibly hope to understand them. And so if something was true in biology or philosophy or literature or economics or the Bible, it was true because of who God is. This realization, this realization freed me to think about and to experience the world in ways, (laughs) listen friends, that didn't have to always militantly take a, a defensive posture or that have to automatically feel attacked by other ideas or the world around me because because I could trust, even in the places I didn't see well, I could trust God's words and his ways because they work better than I had even yet experienced. Think about this. Learning to rest in what God says is true. Instead of having to pretend to be the oracle of the universe, is something our world sure could use a good dose of right now. If we could just invent a a God-truth chill pill, I think that would help a lot. But here's the thing, y'all. If you could learn to rest in the truth of who God is and to trust what he says, it would not only have the same effect, it would free you to love him and to value him and to worship him as God even more. God's truth matters more than we can imagine. So here's our thesis for today that we'll first unpack from Scripture 
And then we'll see how it helps us to learn to rest in who God is and to trust Him in what He's done. God's truthfulness means that He is the true God such that all He knows and speaks creates reality and is the standard of truth. Listen to that again. God's truthfulness means that He is the true God such that all He knows and speaks creates reality and is the standard for truth. Now, just for the record, sometimes people describe this this communicable attribute of God, meaning an attribute that we share in more than other attributes. They describe this attribute as God's veracity or reliability or even faithfulness, but we're just going to call this attribute God's truthfulness. All right. So the first part of our thesis, that he is the true God, this shows that the God revealed in the Bible, Almighty God, capital A, capital G, He is the true God, the real God, compared to all the other so-called small g gods, or as the Bible calls them, idols. Jeremiah 10, verses 10 through 12, they say this, The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting God. All of the gods are dead. They're not everlasting. They're not living. The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth, verse 11, They shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. All other claims are false. He alone is the true God, and all others are lifeless idols. As Jeremiah 10 verse 8 says right before this, they are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. God alone, Almighty God is true, and all other claims are false. The wisdom of the world's powers, according to Jeremiah 10, 8, the wisdom of the world's powers is merely as good as the wood with which idols are made. Think about the first four of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. No other gods, no idols, no name of the Lord in vain, and remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. All four of these were directed at making sure that that we as God's people, we worship God rightly because we acknowledge that He alone is the one true God. There are no other real gods. Idols are fakes. Don't lie or speak with empty words and worship God once a week. These four of the first 10, they were all about keeping top of mind and and heart the idea that the God of the Bible who revealed himself to the Israelites in the Old Testament and that made himself known to us in Jesus, that he is alone the one true God. Jesus himself made this claim when he said to the Father in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you that those whom God had given to Jesus as son, that they would know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, Jesus speaking to the Father. Now, for the second part of our thesis, he is the true God such that, meaning in a way that means that all he knows and speaks creates reality and is the standard of truth. We read earlier in Jeremiah 10, verses 10 and 11, how God alone is true. But look at how verse 12 describes how God's very words create because he is truth. It is he who made the earth by his power, by the power of his word. Look at the next couple phrases. It is he who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding he stretched out the heavens. It's God's being true that makes his wisdom and understanding not merely descriptive of reality, but formative of reality. That this God is alone the true God is why Scripture speaks of him as creator. This is why Genesis 1 describes God as having created by simply speaking. God said, let there be light. 
Time after time throughout the act of creation in Genesis 1, God speaking and making and calling, these are all synonymous with the power that he alone has as the one true God, which means, consequently, that everything that God thinks and that he knows and that he says and that he does is perfect. It's completely right. It's altogether just. It's entirely correct. And whatever other such superlative platitude fits. This is why Job 37, 16 says that God is perfect in knowledge. There are no gaps in his understanding. It's why Deuteronomy 32, 4 calls him a God of faithfulness because everything he says and everything he plans and promises happens exactly as he intends. Psalm 12, 6 says that the words of the Lord are pure words like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. They're seven times pure, completely pure, without any error. Titus 1-2 says, God never lies. Hebrews 6-18 says it's impossible for him to lie. Numbers 23-19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, or, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not fulfill it? Proverbs 30 verse 5 says that every word of God proves true. Friends, God's words are not simply true in the sense that they conform to some arbitrary standard of truthfulness that is outside of God. God's words are truth itself that create and sustain true life. Which is why Jesus can say to the Father about his people in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Jesus was praying to the Father. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Meaning the truth of who God is, when it is expressed, it creates true life. Now, all of this may seem quite heady, uh, but let's begin to apply this to our lives. And think with me about the implications of what we're saying here today. If God alone is the true God, and he creates reality with a word, and he has perfect, complete knowledge, and he is the standard and the measure of all truthfulness, then think about this. When we are truthful, it is not just conformity to God's knowledge, but to who God is when we are thinking truthfully or we say something that is true or we write something true or we do something truthful, it is nothing less than a form of expressing godliness. Embodying truth in thought and deed is speaking the goodness and glory and God's very character and nature. So when we look at the wonder and the beauty of creation around us, and we think of God's power and majesty. We are enjoying and experiencing, even expressing the truth of God as creator. When we pursue knowledge in the natural and the social sciences and the humanities, we are discovering more truth about the nature of reality and more truth of what God himself already knows, which means we are free to rejoice Wherever and whenever we discover truth, we can exclaim with the psalmist in Psalm 137, verse 17, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Do you say that about truth that you experience? How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. Friends, when we grow in our knowledge, it's a part of the process of becoming more godly and conforming more fully to his image. Paul tells us that if we have Christ, then we have a new nature. Colossians 3.10, look at this. We have a new nature that is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, the creator of this new nature. 
In a world, friends, that is extremely careless with its words and with truth, we who have Christ, who have what Paul calls here a new nature, we are to imitate our creator and to take great care to speak truthfully. This is why Paul says in Colossians 3, 9, and 10, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and you've put on this new nature. Same idea, Ephesians 4, 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, because you have this new nature, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor. About his own ministry, Paul said that, that he sought to practice absolute truthfulness. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. God is pleased when his children put devious talk far from them. Proverbs 4.24. And when they speak with words that are acceptable, not only in the sight of those around them, but also in the sight of the Lord himself. Psalm 19, verse 14. Now, not only should we speak truthfully, but one last very important point of application. We should imitate God's truthfulness in our own reactions to both truth and falsehood. Like God, we should love truth and hate falsehood in our reactions and responses to both truth and falsehood. The ninth commandment to, to not bear false witness against our neighbor, Exodus 20, just like all the other commandments, requires us not merely to outwardly conform to God's truth, but also inwardly in the attitudes of our hearts. To be pleasing to God means to speak truth from the heart, Psalm 15, and to hate falsehood, Proverbs 13. Proverbs 12, 22 says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. In numerous places in the Bible, it says not only that God loves the truth, but that he hates lies. He detests false oaths and that the standard of truthfulness cuts all the way to the heart. For as Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks and the body acts and our faces respond to both truthfulness and falsehood. In fact, falsehood and lying and slander and gossip, they come not from God, but from Satan, the father of lies who delights in twisting the truth. In John 8, the words of Jesus say that those who lie show that they are speaking according to their corrupt natures as children of the devil. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Which means at the end of the scriptures in Revelation 21, it's entirely fitting for John to say that the cowardly, faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, and the idolaters are found in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur that is far from the heavenly city, which is where are also found, verse 8, Revelation 21, all liars. God takes this very seriously. Lying and falsehood and slander and gossip are wrong not only because of the great harm that comes from them in practical terms, but for a much deeper and more profound reason that should force us to question whether we worship the one true God or the God of this world and of our own making. You see, when we lie, we dishonor God and we diminish his glory because we are not living in accordance with his perfect and holy and beautiful character and nature that not only deserve, but that also demand that all creation conform by expressing the truth of who he is. Friends, in a world of lies and slander and gossip on every other social media post or, or online feed or or coming from every other person's mouth or actions. In a world like that, being truthful matters to the person who cares about conforming their lives to the truthfulness of God and embodying his goodness and his character. So let's take a minute and let's think about today's takeaway question. What is the number one way 
you have been thinking or speaking that does not express the truth of who God really is. Friends, the Bible says that we find our joy and our purpose in conforming our lives to the character and nature of God. When we are thinking truthfully, speaking truthfully, writing truthfully, responding in truth to falsehood, avoiding lies and gossip and slander, we are expressing godliness and embodying the truth of God's very character, and nature. Father in heaven, we want to be people who express who you are with integrity so that people will not see in us something that they might mistake as something we've done or achieved out of who we are, but that they'll see in us that you're a God of grace and mercy who despite our sin and our rebellion, despite the truth that we are corrupt in nature, seeking for self by perverting the truth of who you are, despite that, Lord, you've given us Jesus, whose perfect and sinless life lived for us. It's the truth that we, we must conform our identity around and say yes to in faith so that his perfect sinless life sacrificed for us could stand as our sacrifice. We love you for that amazing truth, Lord. Thank you for being who you are. Teach us to live in ways that express the truth of who you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.